Hi, and welcome to the exclusive monthly video for June, for Patrons Plus and Channel Members Plus. Before we get started, I want to say a huge thank you for supporting my channel and my work. As always, it's greatly appreciated. Today, we're going to look into some folklore and myths and legends from the Orkney and Shetland Islands commonly referred to as the Northern Isles. We're going to look into a being known as the Tro, or Trow, which is an interesting mix of some Scottish and Nordic folklore because of the history of the islands. Let's get started. Folklore of the Northern Isles is often an interesting mix of Nordic and Scottish because the islands were settled by the Norse for hundreds of years. The Orkney and Shetland Islands were inhabited for at least 8,500 years by prehistoric peoples, and then later by the Picts, who were then pushed out when the Norsemen settled there in the 800s. And it was only in the 1400s that Orkney and Shetland became a part of modern-day Scotland. Unfortunately, there's little evidence on what actually happened to the original inhabitants of the islands after the Norsemen arrived. Some say they were eventually integrated. Others say they may have been taken as slaves. While some suggest they may have simply been killed. Or, perhaps, it was a mixture of all three of these possibilities. In fact, this disappearance of the Pictish people is thought to perhaps have had influence on the legends of the Trolls. Some believe that as the Norse people arrived on the islands, the Pictish inhabitants may have been forced into hiding in many cases leading to tales of the strange folk who keep themselves hidden. But as well as this, there are of course many parallels with the Norse folklore of trolls and the Huldrafolk, or the Icelandic Huldufolk, commonly referred to in English as elves. Interestingly, physical descriptions of the trolls differ quite a lot from one story to another, as well as regionally in some accounts. Sometimes they are smaller humanoids who dress all in grey, very much along the lines of the Icelandic Huldufolk, whereas in other stories they're more monstrous and resemble trolls or giants. Similar to the Scandinavian trolls, they're thought to be nocturnal and come out of their underground homes and caves at dusk, and return again in the morning. The tro is known by a few names. Tro, spelt with a T, also tro with an E on the end, dro with a D, or even dro with a D and a T in the beginning. And the etymology of the word is thought to stem from the Scandinavian word troll. Catherine Mary Briggs also notes that they're often nicknamed Henkies. She says that one name given to the trolls of Orkney and Shetland is Henkies. Like many of the Scandinavian and Celtic fairies, they had one of the defects of the fairies, by which they could be recognised, and these Shetland trolls limped or henked as they danced. It was from this strange limp, dialectically called a henk, that the term henkies came about. It's also been suggested that the name may originate from the word drog or droger, especially considering, as we'll find out in a minute, that there's a clear distinction made between sea troll and land trolls. 
which is also found in Nordic folklore with the sea drog and the land drog, leading many to believe that the tro may have instead come from the drog instead of the troll. There are three distinct types of trolls that are often mentioned. The first is the sea troll, an evil being that came from the depths of the sea. Some earlier stories say that it resembled a male horse covered in seaweed and that it was known to try and mate with women that it came across on the beach. Others have reported that it's a creature covered in scales, with an ugly face, long limbs, webbed hands and feet, and large round feet like discs, which caused them to walk with a slow, strange gait. The sea troll may also take on the form of a woman in some stories, and seeing her in this form brought bad weather and luck. W. Trail Denison's The Scottish Antiquary gives a detailed description of the beliefs surrounding the sea trolls. He says that the sea troll is represented as the ugliest creature imaginable. His face is like that of a monkey. His huge, unwieldy limbs, out of all proportion to his attenuated body, his head slopes to a sharp angle at top, like the roof of a house, and his feet are flat and round as a millstone. His home is in the sea, to which he has been banished by the superior power of the land trolls, and when on land, of which he is very fond, his movements are clumsy, slow and wobbling. His mental powers are of a low order. He is not vicious, but sometimes tries a trick on man, which often ends in his own confusion. His favorite rendezvous is the foreshore, so dear to all supernatural beings. That is, the ground between high and low water, when left dry by the ebb. He would fain extend his wanderings inland, but dare not for fear of his deadly enemy, the land troll. He is well aware that conflict with his foe, by whom he had been so often conquered, can only end in his own confusion. The sea is the only safe retreat from his oppressor. But too lazy to catch fish for himself, the sea troll would often lie at the bottom of the sea, watching the fishermen's lines. If a fish was caught on the hook, the troll would unhook the fish, conveying it to his own capacious mouth. Where there was no fish, the troll would satisfy his hunger by gently removing the bait from the hook. But this was a dangerous prank, for the troll was sometimes hooked and drawn up to the surface, when, if his frightful appearance did not terrify the fishermen, he got the due reward of his temerity. I had almost forgotten to say that the sea trout's skin was covered with scales, and his hair matted, so that it looked like fins falling round his head, and his fingers and toes webbed. The land trolls are perhaps the better known, and the one that are most commonly told of. Catherine Mary Briggs describes them extensively in her Dictionary of Fairies, Hobgoblins, Brownies, Bogies, and Other Supernatural Creatures. She mentions that the trolls of Shetland seem to be connected in some way with the Scandinavian trolls. Some of the trolls are gigantic and monstrous, and often many-headed, as with many of the British giants. Others are of human size, and in many ways like ordinary rustic fairies, clothed in grey. Much like the Scandinavian trolls, 
The Shetland Trolls also found the light of the sun dangerous, but not fatal. A troll who is above ground at sunrise is earthbound and cannot return to its underground dwelling until sunset. Other trolls were often female as male and exhibited many of the traits of ordinary fairies, though they have peculiarities of their own. Many stories tell that they're small grey-clad men. They always walk backwards when under observation facing the person who is ill-lucked enough to spy them. They're so fond of music that they play the fiddle continually, and their melodies are peculiar and wild and sweet, and have a lilt of Gaelic as well as Icelandic tunes. Their homes are located under green knows or sunny hillsides, and they can visit the upper air only after sunset. And if, by any evil chance, one remains above ground a second after sunrise, there he must stay until the sun disappears again. When once the eye is on a trowel and kept there, he can't get away. It is lucky to hear a trowel speak to another, but very unlucky to see one. When a child was trowel stricken, the mother begged three kinds of meal from nine mothers of healthy children, and with that fare the child was fed, and if this cure failed, the child would surely die. A steel blade, a holy book, a bit of silver, a good word, all of these things could protect one from the trowels. But when a trowel took a fancy to a family or district, they would prosper, as he would take them and the land into their care. The trowels were permitted freedom on the earth at one time of the year, and that was during the Yules. Therefore, extra care was taken against their mischief at this season. The folk strove at all times to propitiate the trowels, and were said to live sometimes on good terms with them. But on the whole, they were feared and disliked even more than they seem to have deserved. One story tells of a young trow boy who was guilty of theft from another trow. There was said to be a boy sometimes seen wandering about, clad all in grey and weeping sadly. It was said that the trows were not honest. They would steal anything that they could find, but they never, never took from one another. Now, that would be the worst fault of any. They're very greedy and eager to get silver, and a boy of their own once stole a silver spoon from a king trowel. That boy was the one who was seen wandering. He was banished from Trowland on the moment and condemned to wander forever among the lonesome places of the Isles. But once a year, on Yule Day, he was allowed to visit Trowland. But all he got was eggshells to crack between his teeth, followed by a lunder upon his lugs and a wallop over his back. So he wanders waneless, poor object. But so it was, for that was their law. Another sort of trow is an old man called a kunal trow, a very human sort of creature, but their nature was morbid and sullen. They wandered in lonely places after the sun had set, and were seen at times to weep and wave their arms about. We cease to wonder at that when we learn that there are no female king trows. They marry human wives, and as soon as the baby trow is born, the mother dies. No kunal trow marries twice, so their period of matrimonial bliss is brief. 
It seems a wise arrangement that there should never be more than one son to inherit the questionable character of a Kunal Trau. For you see, a Kunal Trau cannot die until his son is grown up. But some philosophers of the race have tried to live a bachelor life under the pleasing impression that they might become immortal. But the laws of this people have a statute for even such an emergency as that. The male trow who postpones matrimony beyond reasonable limits is outlawed until he brings to Trowland an earthly bride. One trow king, or male trow, braved all consequences and took up his abode in a ruined brook. And for centuries he was the terror of the isles. His only food was earth formed into perfect models of fish, birds, babies. And it was said that those images had the good smell and taste of what they represented in form. He seems to have found his solitary life unendurable and met the advances of some humans with a certain amount of pleasure. But his love of mischief usually brought all friendly overtures to an abrupt conclusion. However, there was once a witch who craved to know the secrets of Trowland, and she went about courting the bachelor, and persuaded him to marry her on the assurance that her art would show him how to prevent the death that he dreaded. The witch's charms worked on the trow, and it was said that she had and it was said that she learnt many things of the trows and their land. She had created, her mother said, a sensation among the trows, but we may suppose that she had not found the life agreeable, for when she went with him to Trowland, she gave her mother many instructions on how to provide against the enchantment of all trows who try to decoy unsuspecting girls into their unhallowed domain. It was said that her parting words were, No, mother, mind that you have your pure things and lasses well kept about you when the grey woman stealers are out upon their pranks. That was this month's exclusive video for Patrons Plus and Channel Members Plus. Again, I want to say a big thank you for you supporting my channel and my work. And, as always, look out for the poll for the next topic for next month. But, as always, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!